Hey guys, and welcome to the first episode of the fourth season of Antagonist Freestream. It's good to be back. And over the past months and better part of the year, I've seen images like those or animations like these here all over my Twitter feed. And it turns out they come from a guy called Sage Jensen. And he's got this really, really great page here where he explains how he generates those kind of animations and images. According to him, his technique is based on this paper here, the characteristics of pattern formation and evolution in approximations of Fizarum transport networks. Well, what is Fizarum? Well, it's a fungus, sort of a low level mushroom. And this whole paper here, in my opinion, belongs into a whole category of so-called neighbor sensing models. I will add links to all those pages here, but that's the original page from the guys who came up with all these neighbor sensing models. So how does that whole setup work? Well, actually Sage Jensen does a really, really great job explaining what he does here and how the whole algorithm works on his webpage here. And also Jake Rice built a few neat setups which are based on these algorithms. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So we're actually interested in kind of the root of a mushroom or a fungus, the mycelium. And mycelia consist of hyphae. These are branching filament structures. And in our model, we're going to model hyphae as particles, which leave a trail. So this will be one of our particles that we're going to simulate. Our algorithm has basically six steps. We will sense grid values from our particle. We will turn particles accordingly, move particles in a new direction, deposit grid values, blur grid values, and attenuate grid values. So let's go over what we're doing. The first thing to notice is that our particles can move in a direction, which I indicated with this arrow here. And the direction is determined by the rotation, the heading of a particle. And in this example, I just noted down the heading of the particle in degrees. And our particles can rotate in fixed steps. In this case, they can either rotate plus 4 to 5 degrees or minus 45 degrees. So they can rotate to the left or the right. And while moving around, our particles leave behind a trail of organic matter. And in our case, in our algorithm, we model this as values in a grid. And it's pretty simple. The more particles are in a grid cell, the higher this grid cell's value, as more particles deposit more organic matter into this grid cell here, compared to this, where we only have one particle. So how do we determine in which direction our particles should turn? Well, we sense values. And for that, each particle has three sensors, one in front, one to the left, and one to the right. And these sensor angles, so the angles that they are spread apart, as well as the sensor distance, so how far in front or to the side of the particle those sensors are, they can be dialed in individually by the user. So each sensor samples the underlying grid, so we read the underlying grid cell value. And then the particle will turn into the direction of the sensor with the biggest sensed value. In our example, it's the right sensor here. There's one special case to notice. If both the right and the left sensor read in exactly the same value, we just randomly decide on one direction. However, in this case, our right-hand sensor is the sensor with the biggest value, so we turn into this direction. We turn right, resulting in this direction of our particle. Take note that in this special case, the turn angle is exactly the same as the sensor spread angle, which does not need to be the case after all, as those values can be dialed in individually later in the setup. Finally, our particle moves one step into the new direction, and this step size here, as well as the sensor spread angles and the turn angles, can be chosen by the user later. Now, finally, let's have a look at the grid and its values. As we already mentioned, we determine how many particles are in each individual grid cell, and deposit values accordingly. Cells with a higher particle count have a higher value. Next, we diffuse those values, which means we just blur out the grid. So those values spread out a bit, like organic matter spreading out in space. And finally, we attenuate our values. That means we multiply them with a factor, resulting usually in a decay. You can see those values have gotten darker compared to the original values here. And then it's back to our first step, sensing the grid values. So again, our algorithm steps are sense grid values, turn particles accordingly, move particles in the new direction and deposit grid values, and on the grid, blur those grid values and attenuate them. And to implement this algorithm, we need to talk about a few things, one of which I want to illustrate here, and it's called the rotation matrix. So a rotation matrix usually is a 3 by 3 matrix. This means it stores 9 values, like here, for example. And this is just some random example of a 3 by 3 matrix, storing 3 by 3, that means 9 values. And this is an example of how one would construct a rotation matrix, which rotates something, usually a vector, around the z-axis. And the angle theta, which is this fancy symbol here, specifies how far we are rotating around this z-axis. And similarly, we can construct rotation matrices for rotations around the x and y-axis as well. And I'm not going to go into detail of how to derive those constructors here. That's the really funky and weird algebraic part. For now, just take my word for it. This works. And Houdini also has some really neat VEX functions to abstract all of this away from us, so we don't have to deal with it. 
So why would we want rotation matrices in our setups at all? Well, because they allow for easy increment or decrement of angles. Let me explain. This is a vector, directional vector in our setup. And in our setup, this is going to be one unit long. So let's rotate this vector using a rotation matrix. In this case, as this is the y and this is the x-axis, we want to rotate this around the z-axis. So that's the axis pointing out of our display. And we're going to rotate around 20 degrees. However, our rotation matrix building rules expect radians as angles. So we are going to convert the 20 degrees into radians, which is 0 0.349. So we'll fill in our matrix values accordingly here. And then in the next step, what we can do is just multiply our vector with this rotation matrix. And it's going to rotate exactly 20 degrees around the z-axis. And I find that pretty neat, because that's just one single multiplication, rotating this whole thing around. Even better for our case, for our setup, is that we can multiply that rotated vector by the same rotation matrix again, and we'll turn that rotated vector 20 degrees around the z-axis again. So that is super handy for our stepwise rotation of our particle. And it's a super short notation here. Just as a quick info, I'm aware that the rotation direction is drawn in the wrong direction. So usually when applying a rotation matrix, this would rotate the angles counterclockwise, not clockwise. But this is just to demonstrate the overall principle. Just to make sure we understood what's going on, just build a quick example, dropping down a geonode in Houdini, diving in there and adding a single point at the zero. 0, 0 position, that's the origin. Let's just display that point, it's here. Maybe increase the point size a bit, so we can see what's going on here. Also, I want to add a vector to this point. In my case, I'm going to use a point triangle. Call this vector dir for direction, and set it to point along the z-axis. Let's visualize it using a visualize node, which in the visualizers tab I'll set to be a marker, a vector visualizing the dir attribute. And I'd like to have a arrow tip as well. So this is my vector pointing in the z direction. Let's call this one init underscore dir. And let's build our rotation matrix. Again, using a point triangle. Call this one rot mat for rotation matrix. And in here, the first thing I want to do is be able to dial in an angle. So I'll need to read in an angle. Let's use a float slider for that. Call it angle click here to create the interface element. And maybe in the parameter interface, let's set its range from 0 to 360. So we can dial in degrees in here, which I'll have to convert to radians. So let's just use the radians function for that. And now let's use this to build our actual rotation matrix. So let's drop down a matrix three, call it rot for rotation. And I want to initialize it. And to initialize a matrix, I'm going to use the ident function, which does not take any parameters here, it just creates an empty standard matrix. Next, I'll turn this initialized matrix into a rotation matrix using the rotate function, which takes our matrix and modifies it. So we don't need to specify an output variable for this. And let's just head to the help page of this function by hitting F1. And this has several function calls. I think we're going to use this one here. So our matrix, which is going to be modified, then the amount that means the amount how much it's rotated in radians, that's the angle basically, and then the axis around which it is rotated as a vector. So we want to rotate for angle degrees, and we want to rotate around the y axis in our case. So 0, 1, 0, y is pointing up, so I want to rotate this vector like this. Let's finally save this out as a point attribute, and the shorthand for that is 3 for matrix 3, at, let's call it rot, equals rot. So now when we middle mouse on this node here, we can see we've got a rotation matrix containing nine floats, three by three matrix, perfect. Before we continue, maybe let's start at an angle, say 20 degrees. And now let's rotate our vector actually using another point triangle. Call this one rotate dir, rotate direction. And what we just need to do here is multiply our dir vector times our rotation matrix like this. And we can see we rotated this vector. And if we change our angle here, you can see this vector keeps rotating. Also, let's try out what happens when we stack those here. So when we multiply again, you can see we're just incrementing by these 22 degrees that I set up in the rotation matrix. So everything is working as expected. And again, the great advantage here is that I can increment in those steps by just a multiplication operation, which is pretty cheap computationally. And also the notation here is rather short. So it makes for a very readable piece of code. Let's use that to build our setup. 